Welcome to the Propreneur Podcast, where we help practice owners become better entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Dino Watt. And welcome once again, everybody, to uh, the Propreneur Podcast. Excited to have you here for another episode where this one's going to be a little different. This one is going to be something I'm super excited about. We've been talking about this for a little while. And uh, our guest today, Rich Christensen, is someone who I have known for, gosh, I want to say it's going on a decade now, and just been able to see the amazing things he does. He intimidates me how awesome he is and all the great things he's in and the way he thinks. He's so smart. And as a listener to this podcast, I want you to really kind of take the time to sit back and don't listen to this one in your car, actually. Make sure you're doing this in your office or in your home, home office, and take notes and really listen, because I think the message that he's going to share with us today is uh, is a ripple effect. It can have a ripple effect on you and your family and your legacy for years to come. And I'm just excited to share that with you. So again, thank you everybody for sharing this podcast with your friends and your colleagues. It's always an honor to go to events and hear people have them come up to me and say, hey, we listened to that show. We listened to this podcast. That was really great information. And uh, it really just, it, it touches my heart that you guys would do this. We're over 120 episodes in and we're keeping going. So thank you for being here again on the Propreneur Podcast. Today's episode is actually going to be our episode with Rich Christensen. He's the author of The Zigzag Principles. He's the author of what? How many books you got out there now, Rich? Oh, a couple, a couple. A couple, <laughs> like, yeah, a lot. Uh, but thank you for being here, Rich. We really appreciate it. Oh, Dino, I got to tell you, as I looked and saw we were doing this, it was highlight of my week. Oh. And I'm just so excited to be with you. I, everyone needs to know when I launched Zigzag Principle, I asked Dino to come be the big MC of it. And I think that really deeply bonded and, and just some of uh, Dino's philosophy on family and bonding and marriage. And uh, it just it's just so aligned. And so I just feel special connected to you. So I'm so thrilled to be here and particularly to talk about this content. Yes. I love it. And when we first uh, reconnected again, talking about this, like the passion that you have for it yeah. is, is just amazing. And I really do like, you know, my stance around marriage. And matter of fact, I'm literally in the middle of, of recording my 12 days of uh, marriage Christmas. You know, we're doing a whole thing where we're giving people 12 tips on how to improve their marriage over the next couple of, of well, really improve their marriage period, but giving them 12 tips on that. So we, we are very much aligned in that. But what I would love people to hear though, Rich, is I'd love to hear your story. Like give us the the, the Cliff Notes version of the Rich Christensen story of how you got here and, and where you're do, what you're doing right now. Well, I think this does shock a lot of people because most people know my background of lean startup and, and, you know, creating 52 businesses and all of that nonsense, but it actually was just the fuel that drove everything else. And so this content, you know, I actually never intended to release. It was something as people would approach and kind of find out about what I was doing with my family, this infrastructure model of my family. Uh, I would say, oh, I jokingly say, oh, yeah, yeah, we won't know if that actually worked until my grandchildren are raised. So, mm. I mean, really to tell the story, I can't, and, I, and, you know, we've talked about this, so I'm going to do it very openly and very honestly, and so uh, maybe a little vulnerably even, but um, when my wife and I first got married, we had $500 in a Dodge Colt that had been totaled three times. Our <laughs> weekly food budget was $12 a week, and I'd say we lived on potatoes and love. Um a couple of three years into our marriage, it became very evident I was going to have some pretty good successes. Uh, I had a mentor that was amazing that believed in me young. And man, my, my career was like a freaking rocket ship going off. And it scared the crud out of my wife and I. Um, at that point, I was earning more than my father and her father combined in their entire mm. end of their career. And so our solution was this, to move to a very poor neighborhood, to never tell our children that we had money and resources because we didn't want our kids to grow up entitled. Mm. So here I am living this like stellar leadership career and then the, this dual life. And I had a friend that came to me and said, Rich, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> what's going to happen when you die? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen when you die? You're going to be very wealthy. Your kids aren't going to know. They won't know how to handle you pass it on. And then he said this, if you don't manage to destroy your children, which you will, you'll certainly destroy your grandchildren. And it so threw me into a disheveled state of mind that my wife and I were just like, well, oh, 
Glaw. <laughs> and so I went on a mission to find a, uh, a model that we could use. And I looked up and down. And what I found, Dino, is, is I found models, great financial models of how to manage your money and how to manage your finance. I, was, I found a ton of them. But I couldn't find anything of how do I entrench values in my family? How do I invent and stabilize my children? And more importantly, my grandchildren, particularly after that really good spanking I took. So uh, true to any entrepreneur, I couldn't find one. So I created my own darn model. <laughs> there you go. It's a great entrepreneur uh, uh, characteristic, right? I created my own darn model. Yes, it is. And, but I honestly didn't know if it would fully work or not. Uh, I was very fortunate at that time to have Stephen Covey as one of my primary life mentors. Wow. So I, I started with uh, family mission statements. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and that was actually the beginning of it. And my wife and I went and wrote this family mission statement. And then I looked at the components that made successful organizations and bit by bit bolded that on and changed the model dramatically. Through mm -hmm. the years, uh, a few of my dearest friends saw it and says, wow, this is amazing as they saw what was going on, Rich. This is crazy. And you've got to share this. No, 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 I'm not going to do it. Never intended to share this. I went super private after my last big book and never intended to come out again. About three years ago, Dino, I had a very significant life interrupt a very significant spiritual experience, honestly, that, uh, that brought me to the point where I, I was basically told to this, you're created. It's one of the three key things I needed to do. So th this content is brought forward with that in mind with the intent of this, we call it the legato family framework. And, and the intent of it is, is to stabilize and to help families, non-traditional families and tribes unify and connect in this crazy barrage of just insanity that's going on in the world right now. Mm. So that's the backstory, wow. real raw that, and relevant. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very big backstory. And, and here's the thing that's really interesting. As you were talking, I was thinking, you know, our audience is primarily uh, orthodontists, dentists, chiropractors, you know, what I call your higher end entrepreneurs. And yeah, they, I, I'm sure many of them listening to this, think of this and think of, wow, a lot of them grew up in a poverty situation or not maybe having any type of legacy money. And now their goal obviously is to build up their business to where they can, uh, they, they make a good living. Uh, they're able to give some of the good things to their, their kids or some opportunities or privileges to their children and hopefully create some sort of legacy off of what they're doing. They're working hard They're They have a, a very specific practice that they do. And so what I love about this is the connection of no matter where you are, we all want to leave our kids better than we were. We want to make sure that there's some sort of legacy going on and that you thought through this and thought, I want to not just not mess up my kids, <laughs> but I also want to create this ripple effect legacy for my grandkids and great grandkids and their grandkids. And they'll always be able to look back. It's actually one of the reasons why I love people writing books, right? It's part of it anyway, is to let them get a piece of, oh, this is how grandpa thought. This is yeah. how grandma thought. Like, no matter if it's about my, the, my story of my life or not, it's about how you thought about this certain thing. Uh, in your life. So when you, what was your biggest hes hesitancy of, of bringing it forward? Like, why were you so kind of holding it close to the vest? Well, first of all, it was very non-conventional, non-traditional, and it's a little bit crazy. I think as we get into, you'll say, man, oh, did you really freaking do that? And it's like, yeah, I really did it. And then the fruits have borne out pretty darn amazing. So, and then secondly, is this is just honestly, it's just very private. It's very intimate, some mm -hmm. of these things. And so it's kind of like, you know, uh, we don't cast pearls before swine. So that's the, that was what pr uh, prompted the, and, and yeah, I don't know. It just, and I didn't want to be outed until I really knew it was working, you know? Yeah, fully. that's true. So there's I a lot of theory know. out there, right? There's a lot of theory of what you could do or should do or whatever, but you wanted to have actually the evidence of it. Well, and, and honestly, I mean, there's this concept that I really love. And I talk a little bit in one of the models of private victory versus public victories. Mm -hmm. And there's an element of, man, just the real rewarding, savoring stuff for me is the private victories, not the public victories. And, and I really valued my uh, anonymity. 
And mm. it's like, I just kind of didn't want to be, you know, something that precious and that careful. And now our kids are all raised and similar to you. We can head off in our metaphorical motor home and gallop yes. and around. And so a little more comfortable with, with the, with the concepts now. So let's break down what legato is and how, you know, it, it have, has affected you and your family and how it can affect other the world really. Great. Uh, happy to happy to do that, Dino. And I'll just follow your lead on that. I did want to go back and comment that one of the things sure. that I, I have seen time and time again is we talk about this three generation wealth cycle. And, and I got this dear friend actually that I created Legato with. His name is Scott Ford. And uh, he has this beautiful precept that he calls the, se the seven generations. It came from the Araqui Nation. And hmm. anytime we're looking at our lives, the Araqui Nation would always look what happened three generations back and the decision I'm making, how does it impact three generations going wow. forward? So a profound new framework. The, the Constitution of the United States, and actually the, the fifth and top framework that we'll talk about in a second is family constitution and the legacy family constitution going on. Mm. The U.S. Constitution was actually derived from Araqui Nation, and much of what we have as the Constitution of the U.S. came from there. They left two key pieces out, and I just asked myself what would have happened if they had put that in. The yeah. first is, is this seven generation concept of look at sustainability and legacy backwards and forwards. What would we be like now if we'd put that in? And the second is, is the equal rights of men and women. And that was the two pieces taken out of this, uh, this concept. So I just think we've got to be really mindful. Uh, you know, anytime we're looking at legacy con conversations, we're looking at the big picture. I love that idea man. just you saying that alone. I mean, I've often, I don't have a huge connection to my past, right? To my, I mean, I know where my grandparents came from I, and, and that, but to think of the future, like what am I actually doing now that's going to affect negatively or positively my three generations away from me? That's yeah, exactly that, right. And that's you know, huge. I've seen so frequently, I'm, I've uh, in all transparency, this content, I've been teaching it to the most wealthy families and influential families in the US and going through them. And it just was non-sustainable for me to run around and do that. So a part of this little project we put together, uh, Dino has been putting a programmatic uh, effort in place. So every family, every tribe can actually do it in the form of a simple little workbook and online programs. Wow. And uh, the result is has just been remarkable what I've seen, you know, occur with, with families. So maybe what we could do, oh, and I, another comment I wanted to make is, is just the death trap that I've seen happen so often of families when they do start to accumulate wealth, work so crazy hard, if they're not cal uh, careful, it was that very fear my wife and I had, is mm -hmm. that wealth then produces stopping to produce value. Uh, right. taking away the learning and growth opportunities, uh, shutting down what I call the value equation, and then entitlement sets in. And children end up then just being dumped into terrible addictive behaviors, abuse mm. behaviors, lack of production. And so many people think that this loss of wealth cycle, um, you know, they say, oh, wealth will be lost in three generations. It's the parents' fault and the kids being stupid. I personally don't believe that. I think that it's actually uh, it's actually the kids or the generation saying this isn't serving us. We got to grind ourselves out of that. So they actually throw it away so they can cycle back up and climb back up into production. The challenge uh, that I've seen, Dino, is, is is just this fall off of three generations. Uh, you know, uh, our our kids falling into just like pig muck. And then having to climb back up out, I'm just kind of through with it. So this model, the total purpose is to take an infinity symbol that's dropping of out of balance with family, out of balance with work. And I'm part of the problem. Zigzag principle was like, ah, oh, so hot that it's like sleep under your desk, work super hard, dude, blah, 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 blah. But that <laughs> drops out of cycle that then drops people into wealth, that then drops to this death that takes this terrible, hard three generations climb out. The sins of the father rest on the children for three generations. And so I really think it's critical. We tip that infinity symbol over, and maybe I can share screen with you in a second. Sure. Show oh, this. Okay. 
But uh, I, as a matter of fact, let me do that. Go for it. Yep, would, go for it. Would you let me take screen here quickly? You should be able to, yeah. Those of you that are watching. As you're doing though uh, that, though, the question that comes to my mind is, um, and this might be something that people are thinking is, so you started this obviously when your kids were very young, you started this and you put this into practice, you held this close to your, your chest. Um, is it too late? Like never, it, never, never too yeah. late. I was with an individual this uh, last week, uh, well, a couple of weeks ago and a multi-billionaire, uh, totally messed his life up, children's Roy, and by putting this uh, program in place, it's like instantly there's hope and, and able to come. Mm. It's never too late. And as you know, working with marriages, ever too late? No, no, it actually isn't. We uh, we have so much grace and the soul is so adaptable. So it's never, my favorite session I've ever taught was with this older gentleman who was 85 years old that brought all his married children in and says, I want you to run us through this as if they were teenagers. We uh. did, they had more fun. Those kids showed up and expressed and, the, the content will, I think, love it. Sense a little love more. It. Let me just finish this last little cycle. And then yeah, if it's yeah. all right, Dino, you know, maybe we can jump in the model because we're yeah, talking all this hyperbole. I, what I think is so critical is, is we drive this, what we call the infinite entrepreneur. Well, personally, physically, emotionally, we're in balance and health and taking care of ourselves rather than this burn it too hot that then drives to a healthy family life, a balanced, healthy, moving family life in equilibrium in what I call the, the middle way that then drives into business opportunities where we get the chance to learn and grow through creation and through business and entrepreneurship and having practice and being on entrepreneurs, being doctors, being uh, chiropractors and influencing in career that then leads to wealth that then fuels personal development. So we run in an infinite loop in cycle and flow rather than this big dropping off the cliff, three generations climb up that's been going on now for a couple of hundred years in the US. Yeah. So the model and how we're doing it, uh, would it be worth me going through that, Dino? Yeah, I think it'd be great. I think I'd love to see it. And uh, for those of you that are listening to this, uh, we are going to explain as much as we can listening, but for those of you that want to jump on the YouTube channel, you can also see this presentation. Uh, Rich is going to share some slides with us and uh, show, those, show us some uh, of his presentation there, but we'll right. talk it and through. Maybe what we can do is, is I'll just send you over these slides so that you have them and you can share those and, and, and send, okay. those, uh, send those out, Dino. But uh, so I'll just verbally paint the picture here. Okay, great. Um, interestingly, when I built this infrastructure, I modeled it after organizations that I saw succeeding. Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna, I think multiple times, oh man, why didn't I think of that? That's so simple, Rich. But what I found is families just aren't doing this. Right. The starting point is, Dino, your values. Have you taken the effort in your family to tightly define what the values are? Do you know the 10 core principle values that your family stand for? Mm -hmm. We know it in business. Yep. I run a major university. We know it in the university. We know it in our religious institutions. Freak, the Kiwanis Club knows what their values are. <laughs> Does your family know what their values are? And by yep. the way, the Bloods and the Crips and the gangs know what their values are. Have you defined what your family values are and what they stand for? Now, equally, if not more important, is, is what you're throwing away. Because generationally, we all have crap that comes in. And there's yeah. some junk that we need to throw away. This is why millennials are just throwing it all out, running from all traditional wisdom. That's really a bad idea, To by the way. If you're thinking of doing that, it's really a bad idea to throw like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years of learning away. The thing to do is selectively say, we're throwing this in the garbage can. In my family, we use guilt and shame like peanut butter. My wife's too. <laughs> We've thrown that away now. So the first step is establishing your values. You already heard some of ours. Non-entitlement, hard work ethic, honesty, loving, goofy. And we, you know, we bolded onto it, but establish the values and then throw the ones that are traditionally back not serving your family into the garbage can. So platform, 
I have a lot of people say, can I do these other super cool, fancy things that you're doing, Rich? And it's like, yeah, you can. But it's like the floods came, or the rains came down and the floods came up. The, came <laughs> down, and the house washed away. Right. <laughs> so first thing you foundation. have to do is walk through the values. And, and I think that, Dean, I'll be sending you this gift box, but all these super fun little ways to identify and go back and identify what the values are. So once you got the values, the next question that the pillar, there's five pillars that go on top of it. Do you have a family logo? What is your symbol? That's what cool. color are you, Dino? What color is Shannon? What wow. color is each of your kids? What is their spirit animal? What is the family mascot? In other words, symbology. Yeah. What's the symbology? I threw this one up right here. I'll throw it for those that have the video. That happens to be our family. In the middle there in white is my wife. She is the center of creation. We hold the safe space. I surround her in black. Then each of my sons, yellow, red, blue, green, light blue, get to point inward, not outward, and uh, cover each other's backs and do so in love. Then when my sons get married, you see a few of those little circles light yeah. up in white. That's them surrounding their wife, protecting, providing. And then when the grandkids come in, see those beautiful little hashes? Yeah. How freaking fun is that? We don't brand Nike. I don't wear me, and I get to be this eccentric, crazy old man now. But I only brand things that the values I align with. What does it mean to my family to have that logo and symbology? Every year we update it and I give a, an allocation for the, this is where my wealth will go in the future, by the way, is, is carrying that symbology forward. What's your family symbol? What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you, my little two-year-old grandchildren, and name the one, Samuel or Joseph, uh, Elise, Everly, they'll want to get the eggs and then they jump on the chicken coop. Yeah, the logo's on the family chicken coop. And wow. they point at it and they say, Uncle Timmy, 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 or oh, Everly. And they know where everybody fits. Wow. That's what really logos cool. are you wearing? What do the values stand for? Utah Jazz have a logo. <laughs> Gangs have logos. Does your family really, have a logo? That's, that's a fascinating concept of you promote and uh, market all these different logos out there that really have nothing to do with your legacy They're you're trying to do it for some sort of identification of, Hey, I'm part of this group. I'm part of the jazz or whatever, but to focus on the legacy or the logo or the marketing of your family. You really got it. Powerful. Do you know how freaking powerful it is to show up with gifts in the selected color that each family member represents? Wow. It instantly says, I see you, I understand you, I get you manifest. Equally but, powerful is the spirit animal. Of what little animal? I'm a mountain gorilla. I went, I was with this family last week. It was so beautiful to watch this family that one son picked like a penguin, the other picked a golden moose, the father, uh, it was just nonetheless, a, a, a gray fox is so fun to see how you manifest and it instantly gives identity. Never well, it's interesting because it. we we do that in ways anyway, right? Like my kids, when I think about this right now, like I know my oldest daughter does not want to have anything to do with purple, right? Yeah. Uh, my my middle daughter does not care about anything pink, but I mean, we already identify them in ways of what we are or are not going to uh, kind of put upon them or what they self identify with, and then when it comes to the animal thing. It's funny you say that because I was in an event years ago that was all about, you know, the enlightened warrior and finding out what your inner warrior is. And uh, oddly enough, mine was the fox. You mentioned the fox, right? It's, <laughs> and so I think about that. I'm like, yeah, I could see where all of our kids and my wife and I have very specific, distinct, natural nature personalities that come out. That's really fascinating. And yes. so now your identification with them is. Yeah, is stronger. You know, it's what an you're extracted level. I see you, and equal yes. to they're positive. But what about their shadow self? Yeah, when you show up and you're feeling glum, all you got to do is put on your beanie, the purple lizard, or yeah. whatever you are. So it's just this beautiful metaphor of I fit, I belong. And again, I will say, gangs do it, 
The Kiwanis clubs do it. Your business has a logo, but I bet your family doesn't. Our most valuable prized possession is, as I had this huge, beautiful metal crest built that hangs in our cabin and it has all the symbology embedded. It, it identifies that you belong to something. I might suggest before you start wearing brands, Look up the values of that brand and see. I, I got so disgusted yeah. with it when I discovered I quit branding. Can I jump to the second one? Yeah, absolutely. Second one is doctrine. So you've got values. Now you've got symbols on top of that. The rules of engagement is the doctrine. Do you have a family slogan? Mm. Do you have a family mantra? Do you have a family mission statement or a family framework document? Do you have a touchstone? Uh, non-verbal clues. I know when my wife and it sat down and formally defined. And again, this is where I started because of my relationship with, with Dr. Covey. I'm so grateful to him. I mean, what impact he had, but the, the, the symbols identify the doctrine identify the rules of engagement. Mm-hmm. So do you, have your children went to a process of setting goals or do you have yearly themes? Do you have doctrines that you resolve around? And again, <laughs> gangs do it the basketball teams do it your business does it but does your family do it so pillar yeah. two is making sure that you get the doctrine and and this uh, you know this methodology mm-hmm. we put together walks through how to do that uh the third any any uh, comments there do you know or <laughs> well well as i sit here and i think about that of um you know years ago when i was doing my marriage course we would do this thing with couples where we talk about branding and i talk about the power of branding in your relationship and uh how branding can mess up right i remember like tropicana changed their branding and they their market share dropped overnight because they changed their package everybody was used to the orange with the little uh straw in it right and then they changed it to something more modern and nobody could find it on the shelf even though it was in the exact same position and so we would have couples do this idea around what's your brand uh what are you putting out there into the world and and it's important to know that of yourselves and what are your of course i'm a huge fan of values with my anybody that's listening to this right now that's been through any of my processes knows when it comes to business again you mentioned it we do this in business you have to have this and unfortunately a lot of businesses don't but the really strong powerful good businesses have this why would you not do this in your family it it won't sustain a business won't sustain a government won't sustain uh, no entity will sustain if you don't do these things i'm talking about i love it so true. okay and my family is the most important there is and we wonder why we're yes. all in hey, your teenagers are all freaking out so the next one do you know the third pillar is is actually the traditions and i think there's two parts to that there's the cadences of comfort uh family mills uh, asking key questions making sure you're there to take them to school if it's a, a child handing them their lap box kissing them on the head a, a family prayer is a key one that we utilized and so cadences of comfort to make sure that you're feeling you know included and and kind of identified and then there's the more uh, the, the more deep rooted important ones that are almost ritualistic in nature. And I know ritualistic has almost like coldish, but it's like anything that endures has it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the, right. what is that? That's, that's, that's very a ritual. very key ritual. You nail at a ball game in front of a vet and do that. And you've offended them. So a lot of times these are really private. So have yeah. you deeply embedded uh, deep traditions in your family? We just went through a key one with our family where we had our son marry this beautiful little redhead. And with great anticipation, they look forward to coming down to the cabin, stand this little girl named Ashley uh, on the mantle. And I present to her a piece of custom made one in the world jewelry in her portion of the family symbol, having her raise her right arm, let's see, symbol, raising your right arm to the square and receiving the family oath. We will support each other, stand by each other. Have you thought to do that? You know the bonding effect of that. And it's so private. I won't even share that publicly what that oath is because it's a private, sensitive thing. In religions, mess with someone's bar mitzvah, mock somebody's baptism. It's private, it's sensitive, and it's the deep inward bonding elements of a community. So if you do not have deep traditions in your family, it's going to be really unstable. Yeah. And what a great way to bring people into the family, letting them know they are a part of the family. And 
and their commitment to it as well. And your commitment to them as being a part of the family. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's really I mean, cool. think of changing. We just got to Thanksgiving. Think of changing Aunt Mabel's terrible, uh, awful cranberry recipe or change the start time from 11 to 1 and watch the family freak right. out. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Tradition, tradition, yeah. tradition, tradition. Now, some of those are bad traditions, maybe a really yeah. bad fight on Ooh. the football field, but those are the ones you throw away. That's what but I love we, about what you said earlier is giving you permission to throw away the things that aren't working to get rid of those. I love that you mentioned that earlier because I think so many of us do the tradition because it's tradition but we are grumpy about it or it doesn't work for us. And we're only doing it because making somebody else, you know, apparently happy or, I mean, what's that, you, you know, that story of the, the hams, right. Where, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the cutting down the ham, honey, why are we cutting down the ham? I don't know. I asked my mom. Well, I did it because my mom did it. Well, I did it because my mom did it. Well, I did it because we had a small, tiny stove and we couldn't fit it in. <laughs> right. Like, like yeah. we do these things sometimes nonsensically, but when you're putting intention and focus behind it, and it's it's growing it's really magic it's really cool that's really neat and that's why you can go do traditions but if you don't have your values cleanly set that's why yes. all of the training the online programs the workbooks everything starts with the values you have to and it takes a little bit of work but once you got that all the rest of stuff is magic you yeah. think oh my kids won't lie. your kids will light up like a christmas tree i haven't been in one event where you teenagers young kids whoever you ask them to draw their spirit animal you ask them to list their favorite food you ask them to go through this beautiful communication cheat sheet exercise and it's like come on mom dad catch up here the rest of the time you can't hold them back so they'll love this stuff but you got to get the values right yeah Okay, can I go to fourth? Let's do it. This is my favorite. And this is a rich ad. And I was really private to share this. I'm now very excited and public in sharing it. But have you thought to put rites of passage into your family, your tribe, and your non traditional family? Huh? Rites of passage. It's a lost art form. And we did it in our family. And this is the part I was most sensitive to sharing. And I'd say, I'm not going to, I don't know this will work until my grandchildren, but now I'm excited to share it. C could I walk through quickly the ages and the rites of passage? Yeah. I would like to know, like understand more of what the rites of passage means. Everybody, uh, by the way, tries to copy mine and I beg you not to do that. Please <laughs> don't copy mine. You can borrow from it, but you've got to set your own values because this tied into our values. Sure. As I did the research, Dino, there were a couple of just key, key ages that identified, and this will go on, by the way, to my children, my grandchildren, my great, great grandchildren on into perpetuity with this fifth pillar, which is the structure or family constitution we put in place. So these key critical ages are eight. When our children turned eight, my wife and I took them on a eight is great date. It's the first time they got to pick where we went to dinner. It was typically someplace not too savory, but we let them pick and then we'd go to a private location. And at that point, we would talk dead straight open about sex, about drugs, about bullying, about technology and all the pitfalls and open a dialogue. And never was it taboo to have conversation at that point. Never again, never became an embarrassment. My sons knew exactly when they had their first wet dream. They were going to come and have a conversation with me and exactly how the sequence, or they're struggling with this or a girl or whatever else. Open dialogue, never shamed for a dead open conversation at eight. Eight is the age that a child switches to cognitive form and function. So eight is great day. Wow. The first 12 year old. When my sons each turned 12, I would take them. Uh, this was called the non-entitlement trip and oh how they look forward to it i would take them to a third world country or abroad for typically with a work project and people say yes rich you overbaked it darn right i overbaked it you don't have to overbake it to this <laughs> level but i wanted to make sure the nail got full root <laughs> all the way planted with one good pound so when my kids were 12 we'd take them i would take them alone on a third world trip we would go uh, to India and ride the elephants through New Delhi and go to the Taj Mahal or climb the Great Well of China or go up the tallest building or my one son wanted to go to the Pokemon Center. Nonetheless, we'd have just this blowout life experience of bonding. The second week, 
was very different. We would go into a Mother Teresa orphanage or hold the little beautiful rescued girls in Kathmandu that were brought in mm. uh, from rescue of the dowry of sexual slavery or killed and harvest their organs and mm. hold and touch humanity at 12 years old for a week and deeply bond with the plight of the world. 12 years old, you don't come back entitled from that. Yeah. You don't come back cell phone addicted. The third week, we would slowly return our trip, stopping a bunch of times with the context of what does it mean to be a Christian and man. In our family, tied to our values, it's protect, provide, and create safe space for women. Hold the space with equality and dignity for women and fix a lot of stuff. So uh, every time my son's out mowing lawn, he's got the context. He sees me going on a trip, hmm. providing, providing dad. And it just became the framework of what it meant to be a Christian and man. So that was the 12 year old trip. The next one is 14. 14, I believe, is the most critical age of all. That's when kids set their path, in my opinion. Mm. It's not 16, it's 14. So at 14 years old, uh, my wife and I together would, uh, we call this the uh, private victory and do hard things trip. We put each one of our sons on a major world mountain peak. Yes, we've climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. We've been wow. on Kalapatar, the mountain that looks up the throat of Mount Everest. 19,000 feet three times. We've climbed not Machu Picchu, wow. Wayne Picchu. We've been on Mont Blanc. We've climbed major world mountain peaks. And those young men at 14 go to the top of the mountain, the last thousand feet crying. <laughs> and they come down men knowing I can do hard things, number one. And number two, private victories, not public victories. Mm -hmm. Private victories, not public victories. Next one is 16 years old. Uh, 16 years old, my sons each made an agreement with me in contract that they would not ask for anything again. They would pay for their own college. They'd pay for their own mission. They would pay for their own car. They would even pay for our family vacations. My three oldest sons all created million dollar businesses in high school. My wow. two younger, my fourth one helped write a best selling book with me. And the youngest built this studio and did more businesses all the last. He was, had his goal reached by the age of 12. So at that point, they take accountability for their future and they learn a skill that can sustain them no matter what the rest of their life. So they're then in charge of their life at 18, kill the business, cut its head off because I want them my peer. And then they donate all the excesses back to the original organization and they, uh, they go and serve humanity very humbly for two years, learning another language. They come back, they're their own men, they're totally my equal. About two years ago, I did bolt one other life. Uh, rites of passage on this is I would take them to a, um, a high security for level four, the, the highest level of prison and teach humanity and fatherhood for, wow. for two days. You deserve a second chance. I deserve a second chance. We all deserve a second chance. And none of us want to be held accountable for our worst thing. And son, I'm very, very sorry. My generation created these terrible problems, misogyny, div divisive political divides, screw up the environment, big social problems. I'm sorry, we screwed it up. Now it's your responsibility to fix these big problems. And that's wow. the rites of passage that deeply embeds and cements the value so deep that you know it's never going to come undone. Never going to come undone. Wow. Never going to come undone. The last one quickly, because I know we're about out of time, yeah. is just the structure, the financial structure, teaching all the secrets of the wealthy, wealthy, like family banking, a family yeah. constitution. We'll never pass our money on to our kids. It becomes a trust that they have a board seat in, that then they have accountability to help humanity. What it does pay for our funds is, is to maintain the legacy cabin, family trip, continue into perpetuity, the family logo going on, and each one of the rites of the passage uh, for my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, my great great grandchildren, my great 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 grandchildren, my great 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 grandchildren, passing on more important than money, legacy and values and the learning yes. and the wisdom 
and a stable structure that I believe now with these elements will outlast even the United States, if I dare say it. Wow. Well, that's what's interesting is I love that you put the financial structure last because so many people put that like, oh, I just need to make money. I just need to make money. I want to pass on money to my kids or whatever. But all four of those are the foundation to actually the finances is, is really not that it's insignificant, but that it is, it's not the focus. That will come when the other things are in place. You can't do that till you do the last. And that's what I realized when I first started to begin with the end in mind. That's where I started. That's why I was terrified. Yeah. So you, you, how do you actually deal with your money? You just screw everyone up if you yeah. don't have your values and the foundation planted. And that's, I think, the power of, of you know, the power of the, this uh, legato model, if I dare say it, Dino. So let's go through them again. So we had the values is first. Values is the base, the, the platform. The base of everything. Right? Symbology on top. Yep. Uh, uh, doctrine, uh, traditions, rights of passage, rights passage, and then what we call the family constitution or the way to wealth, which is the structure, the structural structure. component. Wow. So that's, that's the great. that's the framework, my dear friend. Well, as we are, you know, with uh, what we try to do on this show is always give people resources of ways that they can learn more about things or connect more with things or see how they can incorporate this in their life. This isn't a book. This is a philosophy. This is a, uh, a structure that you've created. Um, what's next? Like, how are you spreading this to the, now that you aren't holding it too close to the chest, now that you are sharing that with people that you've mentioned here, how are you getting this out to the world? Um, it's called Legato Family, and would just invite anyone that would want to learn more. There's a, there's a lot of free resources, but there's also opportunities to engage, you know, so it's legatofamily.com. It's just called the, the entity is called Leg Legato. And uh, it, I think it's actually more in the business. This is a movement to yes. stabilize families and tribes. It's uh, the ones I'm most excited about is non traditional families. Well, that's the thing for me is we, um, well, I, you know, what is a traditional family anymore, right? Especially once you uh, have kids that are choosing their own way, that are, you know, the, the way our society is nowadays with so many options and opportunities out there. But I think my goal for this podcast is really to help the, help the listeners see a possibility and opportunity for the growth of their own legacy, uh, to have some sort of stability to focus on uh, and to to pass on. Like I, for me, I'm excited about it because so many things that you talked about are things that we've talked about, things that I share with my clients, things that, things that I've put into the marriage port, uh, portion of what we do, but really to, to solidify it down with the logos, with the uh, rites of passages, with all that, it's, it's really yeah. exciting. I am so excited to see the impact this has on your, your, your guests and listeners. It's just been so fun. It's been the funnest, most exciting thing I've ever done. It just pale and nothing even comes close to see the impact on what really, really matters. It's one thing to make a million dollar, a big successful business, wow, who cares, honestly, but to actually stabilize and see your teenagers lighting up and, and yeah. unifying and pro and it's messy, but it's just so joyful to see that occurring. So I'm so appreciative of you having me on Dino and, and letting me rant on this hot topic for a few <laughs> minutes. Well, it's my honor and my privilege to do so. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is I want to make sure and just put a plea out there to everybody to go to the Legato family. It's L-E-G-A-D-O family.com and uh, check it out. Just see if it's something. And man, even one of the pillars, like it, let's just say everybody just decided to go out and do uh, values and actually have specific values in their home, how that would change the way that you guys connect. And then just add on top of that if you're able to, is, is amazing. So thank you, Rich, for sharing with us. You're so very welcome, my friend. Well, everybody, thank you again for joining us on this episode of the Propreneur Podcast. As always, our goal here is to give you the best practices possible for your business and your family. And of course, to help you be more proactive, productive, and profitable in all areas of your life and business. We'll see you on the next episode, everybody. Thanks so much again for listening to the Propreneur Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do so. Also, if you feel like you might be a good fit for our podcast as a guest or know somebody who you think would be, 
go ahead and email us at dino at dinowatt.com. Again, thanks for support. We'll see you on the next episode.